Section 11 of The Age of Reason by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Thomas Copeland. The Age of Reason, Book 2, Chapter 3, Conclusion. In the former part of The Age of Reason, I have spoken of the three frauds, mystery, miracle, and prophecy. And as I have seen nothing in any of the answers to that work that in the least affects what I have there said upon those subjects, I shall not encumber this second part with additions that are not necessary. I have spoken also in the same work upon what is called Revelation, and have shown the absurd misapplication of that term to the books of the Old Testament and the New. For certainly Revelation is out of the question in reciting anything of which man has been the actor or the witness. That which man has done or seen needs no revelation to tell him he has done it or seen it, for he knows it already nor to enable him to tell it or write it. It is ignorance or imposition to apply the term revelation in such cases, yet the Bible and Testament are classed under this fraudulent description of being all revelation. Revelation, then, so far as the term has relation between God and man, can only be applied to something which God reveals of his will to man. But though the power of the Almighty to make such a communication is necessarily admitted, because to that power all things are possible, yet the thing so revealed, if anything ever was revealed, and which, by the by, it is impossible to prove, is revelation to the person only to whom it is made. His account of it to another is not revelation, and whoever puts faith in that account puts it in the man from whom the account comes, and that man may have been deceived, or may have dreamed it, or he may be an impostor and may lie. There is no possible criterion whereby to judge of the truth of what he tells, for even the morality of it would be no proof of revelation. In all such cases the proper answer should be, when it is revealed to me I will believe it to be revelation. But it is not and cannot be incumbent upon me to believe it to be revelation before. Neither is it proper that I should take the word of man as the word of God and put man in the place of God. This is the manner in which I have spoken of revelation in the former part of the Age of Reason, and which, whilst it reverentially admits revelation as a possible thing, because, as before said, to the Almighty all things are possible, it prevents the imposition of one man upon another, and precludes the wicked use of pretended revelation. But though speaking for myself I thus admit the possibility of revelation, I totally disbelieve that the Almighty ever did communicate anything to man by any mode of speech in any language, or by any kind of vision or appearance, or by any means which our senses are capable of receiving, otherwise than by the universal display of himself in the works of the creation, and by that repugnance we feel in ourselves to bad actions and disposition to good ones. Note. A fair parallel of the then unknown aphorism of Kant. Two things fill the soul with wonder and reverence, increasing evermore as I meditate more closely upon them, the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. Critic de Praktisch in Vernunft, 1788. Kant's religious utterances at the beginning of the French Revolution brought on him a royal mandate of silence because he had worked out from the moral law within a principle of human equality precisely similar to that which Paine had derived from his Quaker doctrine of the inner light of every man. About the same time, Paine's writings were suppressed in England. Paine did not understand German, but Kant, though always independent in the formation of his opinions, was evidently well acquainted with the literature of the Revolution in America, England, and France. Editor return to text. The most detestable wickedness, the most horrible cruelties, and the greatest miseries that have afflicted the human race have had their origin in this thing called revelation or revealed religion. It has been the most dishonorable belief against the character of the divinity, the most destructive to morality and the peace and happiness of man that ever was propagated since man began to exist. It is better, far better, that we admitted, if it were possible, a thousand devils to roam at large and to preach publicly the doctrine of devils, 
if there were any such, than that we permitted one such impostor and monster as Moses, Joshua, Samuel, and the Bible prophets to come with the pretended word of God in his mouth and have credit among us. Whence arose all the horrid assassinations of whole nations of men, women, and infants with which the Bible is filled, and the bloody persecutions and tortures unto death and religious wars that since that time have laid Europe in blood and ashes? Whence arose they but from this impious thing called revealed religion, and this monstrous belief that God has spoken to man? The lies of the Bible have been the cause of the one, and the lies of the testament of the other. Some Christians pretend that Christianity was not established by the sword, but of what period of time do they speak? It was impossible that twelve men could begin with the sword. They had not the power. But no sooner were the professors of Christianity sufficiently powerful to employ the sword than they did so, and the stake and faggot too. And Mahomet could not do it sooner. By the same spirit that Peter cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, if the story be true, he would cut off his head and the head of his master, had he been able. Besides this, Christianity grounds itself originally upon the Hebrew Bible, and the Bible was established altogether by the sword, and that in the worst use of it, not to terrify, but to extirpate. The Jews made no converts, they butchered all. The Bible is the sire of the New Testament, and both are called the Word of God. The Christians read both books, the ministers preach from both books, and this thing called Christianity is made up of both. It is then false to say that Christianity was not established by the sword. The only sect that has not persecuted are the Quakers, and the only reason that can be given for it is that they are rather deists than Christians. They do not believe much about Jesus Christ, and they call the scriptures a dead letter. Note, this is an interesting and correct testimony as to the beliefs of the earlier Quakers, one of whom was Paine's father, editor. Return to text. Had they called them by a worse name, they had been nearer the truth. It is incumbent on every man who reverences the character of the Creator and who wishes to lessen the catalogue of artificial miseries and remove the cause that has sown persecutions thick among mankind to expel all ideas of a revealed religion as a dangerous heresy and an impious fraud. What is it that we have learned from this pretended thing called revealed religion? Nothing that is useful to man, and everything that is dishonorable to his Maker. What is it the Bible teaches us? Rapping, cruelty, and murder. What is it the Testament teaches us? to believe that the Almighty committed debauchery with a woman engaged to be married, and the belief of this debauchery is called faith. As to the fragments of morality that are irregularly and thinly scattered in those books, they make no part of this pretended thing revealed religion. They are the natural dictates of conscience and the bonds by which society is held together, and without which it cannot exist, and are nearly the same in all religions and in all societies. The Testament teaches nothing new upon this subject, and where it attempts to exceed, it becomes mean and ridiculous. The doctrine of not retaliating injuries is much better expressed in Proverbs, which is a collection as well from the Gentiles as the Jews than it is in the Testament. It is there said, 25, 21, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. Note. According to what is called Christ's Sermon on the Mount, in the book of Matthew, where, among some other and good things, a great deal of this feigned morality is introduced, it is there expressly said that the doctrine of forbearance, or of not retaliating injuries, was not any part of the doctrine of the Jews. But, as this doctrine is found in Proverbs, it must, according to that statement, have been copied from the Gentiles, from whom Christ had learned it. Those men whom Jewish and Christian idolaters have abusively called heathen had much better and clearer ideas of justice and morality than are to be found in the Old Testament, so far as it is Jewish, or in the New. The answer of Solon on the question, which is the most perfect popular government, 
has never been exceeded by any man since his time as containing a maxim of political morality. That, says he, where the least injury done to the meanest individual is considered as an insult on the whole constitution. Solon lived about five hundred years before Christ. Author, return to text. But when it is said, as in the Testament, if a man smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also, it is assassinating the dignity of forbearance and sinking man into a spaniel. Loving of enemies is another dogma of feigned morality, and has besides no meaning. It is incumbent on man, as a moralist, that he does not revenge an injury, and it is equally as good in a political sense, for there is no end to retaliation. Each retaliates on the other and calls it justice. But to love in proportion to the injury, if it could be done, would be to offer a premium for a crime. Besides, the word enemies is too vague and general to be used in a moral maxim, which ought always to be clear and defined, like a proverb. If a man be the enemy of another from mistake and prejudice, as in the case of religious opinions, and sometimes in politics, that man is different to an enemy at heart with a criminal intention. And it is incumbent upon us, and it contributes also to our own tranquillity, that we put the best construction upon a thing that it will bear. But even this erroneous motive in him makes no motive for love of the other part. And to say that we can love voluntarily and without a motive is morally and physically impossible. Morality is injured by prescribing to it duties that in the first place are impossible to be performed, and if they could be, would be productive of evil. Or, as before said, be premiums for crime. The maxim of doing as we would be done unto does not include this strange doctrine of loving enemies, for no man expects to be loved himself for his crime or for his enmity. Those who preach this doctrine of loving their enemies are in general the greatest persecutors, and they act consistently by so doing, for the doctrine is hypocritical, and it is natural that hypocrisy should act the reverse of what it preaches. For my own part, I disown the doctrine, and consider it as a feigned and fabulous morality. Yet the man does not exist that can say I have persecuted him, or any man, or set of men, either in the American Revolution or in the French Revolution, or that I have in any case returned evil for evil. But it is not incumbent on man to reward a bad action with a good one, or to return good for evil. And wherever it is done, it is a voluntary act and not a duty. It is also absurd to suppose that such doctrine can make any part of a revealed religion. We imitate the moral character of the Creator by forbearing with each other, for He forbears with all. But this doctrine would imply that He loved man not in proportion as He was good, but as He was bad. If we consider the nature of our condition here, we must see there is no occasion for such a thing as revealed religion. What is it we want to know? Does not the creation, the universe we behold, preach to us the existence of an almighty power that governs and regulates the whole? And is not the evidence that this creation holds out to our senses infinitely stronger than anything we can read in a book that any impostor might make and call the word of God? As for morality, the knowledge of it exists in every man's conscience. Here we are. The existence of an almighty power is sufficiently demonstrated to us, though we cannot conceive, as it is impossible we should, the nature and manner of its existence. We cannot conceive how we came here ourselves, and yet we know for a fact that we are here. We must know also that the power that called us into being can, if he please, and when he pleases, call us to account for the manner in which we have lived here. And therefore, without seeking any other motive for the belief, it is rational to believe that he will, for we know beforehand that he can. The probability, or even possibility, of the thing is all that we ought to know. For if we knew it as a fact, we should be the mere slaves of terror. Our belief would have no merit, and our best actions no virtue. Deism, then, teaches us, without the possibility of being deceived, all that is necessary or proper to be known. The creation is the Bible of the deist. 
He there reads in the handwriting of the Creator himself the certainty of his existence and the immutability of his power, and all other Bibles and Testaments are to him forgeries. The probability that we may be called to account hereafter will to reflecting minds have the influence of belief, for it is not our belief or disbelief that can make or unmake the fact. As this is the state we are in, and which is proper we should be in, as free agents, it is the fool only, and not the philosopher, nor even the prudent man, that will live as if there were no God. But the belief of a God is so weakened by being mixed with the strange fable of the Christian creed, and with the wild adventures related in the Bible, and the obscurity and obscene nonsense of the Testament, that the mind of man is bewildered as in a fog. Viewing all these things in a confused mass, he confounds fact with fable, and as he cannot believe all, he feels a disposition to reject all. But the belief of a god is a belief distinct from all other things, and ought not to be confounded with any. The notion of a trinity of gods has enfeebled the belief of one god. A multiplication of beliefs acts as a division of belief and, in proportion as anything is divided, it is weakened. Religion, by such means, becomes a thing of form instead of fact, of notion instead of principle. Morality is banished to make room for an imaginary thing called faith, and this faith has its origin in a supposed debauchery. A man is preached instead of a god. An execution is an object for gratitude, the preachers daub themselves with the blood, like a troop of assassins, and pretend to admire the brilliancy it gives them. They preach a humdrum sermon on the merits of the execution, then praise Jesus Christ for being executed, and condemn the Jews for doing it. A man, by hearing all this nonsense lumped and preached together, confounds the God of the creation with the imagined God of the Christians, and lives as if there were none. Of all the systems of religion that ever were invented, there is none more derogatory to the Almighty, more unedifying to man, more repugnant to reason, and more contradictory in itself than this thing called Christianity. Too absurd for belief, too impossible to convince, and too inconsistent for practice, it renders the heart torpid, or produces only atheists and fanatics. As an engine of power, it serves the purpose of despotism, and as a means of wealth, the avarice of priests. But so far as respects the good of man in general, it leads to nothing here or hereafter. The only religion that has not been invented, and that has in it every evidence of divine originality, is pure and simple deism. It must have been the first, and will probably be the last that man believes. But pure and simple deism does not answer the purpose of despotic governments. They cannot lay hold of religion as an engine, but by mixing it with human inventions, and making their own authority a part. Neither does it answer the avarice of priests, but by incorporating themselves and their functions with it, and becoming, like the government, a party in the system. It is this that forms the otherwise mysterious connection of church and state the church human, and the state tyrannic. Were a man impressed as fully and strongly as he ought to be with the belief of a god, his moral life would be regulated by the force of belief. He would stand in awe of God and of himself, and would not do the thing that could not be concealed from either. To give this belief the full opportunity of force, it is necessary that it acts alone. This is deism. But, when according to the Christian Trinitarian scheme, one part of God is represented by a dying man, and another part called the Holy Ghost by a flying pigeon, it is impossible that belief can attach itself to such wild conceits. Note, the book called the Book of Matthew says, 3.16, that the Holy Ghost descended in the shape of a dove. It might as well have said a goose. The creatures are equally harmless and the one is as much a nonsensical lie as the other. Acts 2, 2 and 3, says that it descended in a mighty rushing wind in the shape of cloven tongues. 
Perhaps it was cloven feet. Such absurd stuff is fit only for tales of witches and wizards. Arthur. Return to text. It has been the scheme of the Christian Church, and of all the other invented systems of religion, to hold man in ignorance of the Creator, as it is of government to hold him in ignorance of his rights. The systems of the one are as false as those of the other, and are calculated for mutual support. The study of theology, as it stands in Christian churches, is the study of nothing. It is founded on nothing. It rests on no principles. It proceeds by no authorities. It has no data. It can demonstrate nothing, and admits of no conclusion. Not anything can be studied as a science without our being in possession of the principles upon which it is founded, and as this is not the case with Christian theology, it is therefore the study of nothing. Instead, then, of studying theology as is now done, out of the Bible and Testament, the meanings of which books are always controverted, and the authenticity of which is disproved, it is necessary that we refer to the Bible of the creation. The principles we discover there are eternal and of divine origin. They are the foundation of all the science that exists in the world, and must be the foundation of theology. We can know God only through his works. We cannot have a conception of any one attribute but by following some principle that leads to it. We have only a confused idea of his power if we have not the means of comprehending something of its immensity. We can have no idea of his wisdom but by knowing the order and manner in which it acts. The principles of science lead to this knowledge. For the creator of man is the creator of science, and it is through that medium that man can see God, as it were, face to face. Could a man be placed in a situation and endowed with power of vision to behold at one view and to contemplate deliberately the structure of the universe, to mark the movements of the several planets, the cause of their varying appearances, the unerring order in which they revolve, even to the remotest comet, their connection and dependence on each other, and to know the system of laws established by the Creator that governs and regulates the whole, he would then conceive, far beyond what any church theology can teach him, the power, the wisdom, the vastness, the munificence of the Creator. He would then see that all the knowledge man has of science, and that all the mechanical arts by which he renders his situation comfortable here, are derived from that source. His mind, exalted by the scene and convinced by the fact, would increase in gratitude as it increased in knowledge. His religion, or his worship, would become united with his improvement as a man. Any employment he followed that had connection with the principles of the creation, as everything of agriculture, of science, and of the mechanical arts has, would teach him more of God and of the gratitude he owes to him than any theological Christian sermon he now hears. Great objects inspire great thoughts. Great munificence excites great gratitude. But the groveling tales and doctrines of the Bible and the Testament are fit only to excite contempt. Though man cannot arrive, at least in this life, at the actual scene I have described, he can demonstrate it because he has knowledge of the principles upon which the creation is constructed. We know that the greatest works can be represented in model, and that the universe can be represented by the same means. The same principles by which we measure an inch or an acre of ground will measure to millions in extent. A circle of an inch diameter has the same geometrical properties as a circle that would circumscribe the universe. The same properties of a triangle that will demonstrate upon paper the course of a ship will do it on the ocean, and when applied to what are called the heavenly bodies will ascertain to a minute the time of an eclipse, though those bodies are millions of miles distant from us. This knowledge is of divine origin, and it is from the Bible of the creation that man has learned it, and not from the stupid Bible of the church that teaches man nothing. Note, the Bible makers have undertaken to give us in the first chapter of Genesis an account of the creation, and in doing this they have demonstrated nothing but their ignorance. They make there to have been three days and three nights, evenings and mornings, before there was any sun, when it is the presence or absence of the sun that is the cause of day and night, and what is called his rising and setting, that of morning and evening. Besides, 
it is a puerile and pitiful idea to suppose the Almighty to say, Let there be light. It is the imperative manner of speaking that a conjurer uses when he says to his cups and balls, Presto, be gone, and most probably has been taken from it, as Moses and his rod is a conjurer and his wand. Longinus calls this expression the sublime, and by the same rule the conjurer is sublime too, for the manner of speaking is expressively and grammatically the same. When authors and critics talk of the sublime, they see not how nearly it borders on the ridiculous. The sublime of the critics, like some parts of Edin Burke's sublime and beautiful, is like a windmill just visible in a fog, which imagination might distort into a flying mountain or an archangel or a flock of wild geese. Author, return to text. All the knowledge man has of science and of machinery, by the aid of which his existence is rendered comfortable upon earth, and without which he would be scarcely distinguishable in appearance and condition from a common animal, comes from the great machine and structure of the universe. The constant and unwearied observations of our ancestors upon the movements and revolutions of the heavenly bodies in what are supposed to have been the early ages of the world, have brought this knowledge upon earth. It is not Moses and the prophets, nor Jesus Christ, nor his apostles that have done it. The Almighty is the great mechanic of the creation, the first philosopher and original teacher of all science. Let us then learn to reverence our Master, and not forget the labors of our ancestors. Had we at this day no knowledge of machinery, and were it possible that man could have a view, as I have before described, of the structure and machinery of the universe, he would soon conceive the idea of constructing some, at least, of the mechanical works we now have, and the idea so conceived would progressively advance in practice. Or could a model of the universe, such as is called an orrery, be presented before him and put in motion, his mind would arrive at the same idea. Such an object and such a subject would, whilst it improved him in knowledge, useful to himself as a man and a member of society, as well as entertaining, afford far better matter for impressing him with a knowledge of and a belief in the Creator, and of the reverence and gratitude that man owes to him, than the stupid texts of the Bible and the Testament, from which, be the talents of the preacher what they may, only stupid sermons can be preached. If man must preach, let him preach something that is edifying, and from the texts that are known to be true. The Bible of the creation is inexhaustible in texts. Every part of science, whether connected with the geometry of the universe, with the systems of animal and vegetable life, or with the properties of inanimate matter, is a text as well for devotion as for philosophy, for gratitude as for human improvement. It will perhaps be said that if such a revolution in the system of religion takes place, every preacher ought to be a philosopher. Most certainly, and every house of devotion a school of science. It has been by wandering from the immutable laws of science and the light of reason, and setting up an invented thing called revealed religion, that so many wild and blasphemous conceits have been formed of the Almighty. The Jews have made him the assassin of the human species to make room for the religion of the Jews. The Christians have made him the murderer of himself and the founder of a new religion to supersede and expel the Jewish religion. And to find pretense and admission for these things, they must have supposed his power or his wisdom imperfect or his will changeable, and the changeableness of the will is the imperfection of the judgment. The philosopher knows that the laws of the Creator have never changed with respect either to the principles of science or the properties of matter. Why, then, is it to be supposed they have changed with respect to man? I here close the subject. I have shown in all the foregoing parts of this work that the Bible and Testament are impositions and forgeries, and I leave the evidence I have produced in proof of it to be refuted, if any one can do it, and I leave the ideas that are suggested in the conclusion of the work to rest on the mind of the reader, certain as I am that when opinions are free, either in matters of government or religion, truth will finally and powerfully prevail. End of the Age of Reason End of Section 11
Section 12 of The Age of Reason by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Thomas Copeland. The Age of Reason, Volume 3, Letters Concerning the Age of Reason. 1. An Answer to a Friend. Paris, May 12, 1797. In your letter of the 20th of March, you give me several quotations from the Bible, which you call the Word of God, to show me that my opinions on religion are wrong, and I could give you as many from the same book to show that yours are not right. Consequently, then, the Bible decides nothing, because it decides any way and every way one chooses to make it. But by what authority do you call the Bible the Word of God? For this is the first point to be settled. It is not your calling it so that makes it so, any more than the Mahometans calling the Quran the Word of God makes the Quran to be so. The Popish councils of Nice and Laodicea, about 350 years after the time the person called Jesus Christ is said to have lived, voted the books that now compose what is called the New Testament to be the Word of God. This was done by yeas and nays, as we now vote a law. The Pharisees of the Second Temple, after the Jews returned from captivity in Babylon, did the same by the books that now compose the Old Testament, and this is all the authority there is which to me is no authority at all. I am as capable of judging for myself as they were, and I think more so, because as they made a living by their religion, they had a self-interest in the vote they gave. You may have an opinion that a man is inspired, but you cannot prove it, nor can you have any proof of it yourself, because you cannot see into his mind in order to know how he comes by his thoughts. And the same is the case with the word revelation. There can be no evidence of such a thing, for you can no more prove revelation than you can prove what another man dreams of, neither can he prove it himself. It is often said in the Bible that God spake unto Moses, but how do you know that God spake unto Moses? Because you will say the Bible says so. The Koran says that God spake unto Muhammad. Do you believe that too? No. Why not? Because you will say, you do not believe it, and so, because you do and because you don't, is all the reason you can give for believing or disbelieving, except that you will say that Muhammad was an impostor. And how do you know Moses was not an impostor? For my own part, I believe that all are impostors who pretend to hold verbal communication with the deity. It is the way by which the world has been imposed upon. But if you think otherwise, you have the same right to your opinion that I have to mine, and must answer for it in the same manner. But all this does not settle the point, whether the Bible be the word of God or not. It is therefore necessary to go a step further. The case, then, is you form your opinion of God from the account given of him in the Bible, and I form my opinion of the Bible from the wisdom and goodness of God manifested in the structure of the universe and in all works of creation. The result in these two cases will be that you, by taking the Bible for your standard, will have a bad opinion of God, and I, by taking God for my standard, shall have a bad opinion of the Bible. The Bible represents God to be a changeable, passionate, vindictive being, making a world and then drowning it, afterwards repenting of what he had done and promising not to do so again setting one nation to cut the throats of another, and stopping the course of the sun till the butchery should be done. But the works of God in the creation preach to us another doctrine. In that vast volume we see nothing to give the idea of a changeable, passionate, vindictive God. Everything we there behold impresses us with a contrary idea, that of unchangeableness and of eternal order, harmony, and goodness. The sun and the seasons return at their appointed time, and everything in the creation proclaims that God is unchangeable. Now, which am I to believe? A book that any impostor might make and call the word of God, or the creation itself, which none but an almighty power could make? For the Bible says one thing, and the creation says the contrary. The Bible represents God with all the passions of a mortal, and the creation proclaims him with all the attributes of a god. It is from the Bible that man has learned cruelty, rapine, and murder. 
for the belief of a cruel god makes a cruel man. That bloodthirsty man called the prophet Samuel makes God to say, 1 Samuel 15, 3, Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. That Samuel or some other impostor might say this is what, at this distance of time, can either be proved or disproved, but in my opinion it is blasphemy to say, or to believe, that God said it. All our ideas of the justice and goodness of God revolt at the impious cruelty of the Bible. It is not a God just and good, but a devil under the name of God that the Bible describes. What makes this pretended order to destroy the Amalekites appear the worse is the reason given for it. The Amalekites four hundred years before, according to the account in Exodus 17, but which has the appearance of fable from the magical account it gives of Moses holding up his hands, had opposed the Israelites coming into their country, and this the Amalekites had a right to do, because the Israelites were the invaders, as the Spaniards were the invaders of Mexico. And this opposition by the Amalekites at that time is given as a reason that the men, women, infants, and sucklings, sheep, and oxen, camels, and asses, that were born four hundred years afterwards, should be put to death. And, to complete the horror, Samuel hewed Agag, the chief of the Amalekites, in pieces, as you would hew a stick of wood. I will bestow a few observations on this case. In the first place, nobody knows who the author or writer of the book of Samuel was, and therefore the fact itself has no other proof than anonymous or hearsay evidence, which is no evidence at all. In the second place, this anonymous book says that this slaughter was done by the express command of God, but all our ideas of the justice and goodness of God give the lie to the book, and as I never would believe any book that ascribes cruelty and injustice to God, I therefore reject the Bible as unworthy of credit. As I have now given you my reasons for believing that the Bible is not the word of God, that it is a falsehood, I have a right to ask you your reasons for believing the contrary. But I know you can give me none except that you were educated to believe the Bible, and as the Turks give the same reason for believing the Koran, it is evident that education makes all the difference, and that reason and truth have nothing to do in the case. You believe in the Bible from the accident of birth, and the Turks believe in the Koran from the same accident, and each calls the other infidel. But leaving the prejudice of education out of the case, the unprejudiced truth is that all are infidels who believe falsely of God, whether they draw their creed from the Bible or from the Koran, from the Old Testament or from the New. When you have examined the Bible with the attention that I have done, for I do not think you know much about it, and permit yourself to have just ideas of God, you will most probably believe as I do. But I wish you to know that this answer to your letter is not written for the purpose of changing your opinion. It is written to satisfy you and some other friends whom I esteem that my disbelief of the Bible is founded on a pure and religious belief in God. For, in my opinion, the Bible is a gross libel against the justice and goodness of God in almost every part of it. Thomas Paine 2. Correspondence with the Honorable Samuel Adams Note, the Honorable Samuel Adams, 1722-1803, to was from the Stamp Act agitation of 1764 to the Declaration of Independence in 1776 the preeminent revolutionary leader in Massachusetts and General Gage was given orders to send him over to London, where a newspaper predicted that his head would appear on Temple Bar. He was sent by Massachusetts, with his cousin John Adams, afterwards President, to the First Continental Congress, 1774, where he was suspected, with justice, of being favorable to separation from England. When Paine published his famous Appeal for American Independence, January 10, 1776, Samuel Adams was the first member of the Congress at his side, and a cordial lifelong relation existed between the two. 
It is to my mind certain that these two men were the real pioneers of American independence, and they were both inspired therein by their widely different religious sentiments. Samuel Adams was the son of a deacon of the Old South Church, Boston, who sent his son to Harvard College with the hope that he would graduate into a minister. The son had no taste for theology, but he made up for it by retaining through all his career as a lawyer and public man a rigid Puritanism, of which the first article was hatred of the British system of royalty and prelacy. While Adams's desire for American independency was largely an inheritance from New England Puritans, Paine beheld in it a means of establishing a republic based on the principles of Quakerism, the divine light in every man by virtue of which all were equal. Samuel Adams died October 2nd, 1803. The correspondence here given was printed in the National Intelligencer, Washington City, February 2nd, 1803, as one of a series of ten letters addressed to the citizens of the United States on his return after his fifteen eventful years in Europe. These letters were printed in a pamphlet in London, 1804, by his friend Thomas Clyle Rickman, whose task, however, was achieved under sad intimidation. Rickman's preface opens with the words, The following little work would not have been published had there been anything in it the least offending against the government or individuals. Under this deadly fear, the much-prosecuted Rickman mutilated Paine's letter to Adams a good deal. I have been fortunate in being able to print the letter from Paine's own manuscript, which was recently discovered among the papers of George Bancroft, the historian, when they passed into the possession of the Lennox Library in New York, to whose excellent librarian I owe thanks for this and other favors. Editor, return to text. To the editor of the National Intelligencer, Federal City. Towards the latter end of last December, I received a letter from a venerable patriot, Samuel Adams, dated Boston, November 30th. It came by a private hand, which I supposed was the cause of the delay. I wrote Mr. Adams an answer dated January 1st, and that I might be certain of his receiving it, and also that I might know of that reception, I desired a friend of mine at Washington to put it under cover to some friend of his at Boston, and desire him to present it to Mr. Adams. The letter was accordingly put under cover while I was present, and given to one of the clerks of the post office to seal and put in the mail. The clerk put it in his pocketbook, and either forgot to put it in the mail, or supposed he had done so among other letters. The Postmaster General, on learning this mistake, informed me of it last Saturday, and as the cover was then out of date, the letter was put under a new cover, with the same request, and forwarded by the post. I felt concern at this accident, lest Mr. Adams should conclude I was unmindful of his attention to me, and therefore, lest any further accident should prevent or delay his receiving it, as well as to relieve myself from that concern, I give the letter an opportunity of reaching him by the newspapers. I am the more induced to do this, because some manuscript copies have been taken of both letters, and therefore there is a possibility of imperfect copies getting into print. And besides this, if some of the Federalist printers, for I hope they are not all base alike, could get hold of a copy, they would make no scruple of altering it and publishing it as mine. I therefore send you the original letter of Mr. Adams, and my own copy of the answer. Thomas Paine, Federal City. Boston, November 30th, 1802. Sir, I have frequently with pleasure reflected on your services to my native and your adopted country. Your common sense and your crisis unquestionably awakened the public mind and led the people loudly to call for a declaration of our national independence. I therefore esteemed you as a warm friend to the liberty and lasting welfare of the human race. But when I heard that you had turned your mind to a defense of infidelity, I felt myself much astonished and more grieved that you had attempted a measure so injurious to the feelings and so repugnant to the true interest of so great a part of the citizens of the United States. The people of New England, if you will allow me to use a scripture phrase, are fast returning to their first love. Will you excite among them the spirit of angry controversy at a time when they are hastening to unity and peace? 
I am told that some of our newspapers have announced your intention to publish an additional pamphlet upon the principles of your age of reason. Do you think that your pen, or the pen of any other man, can unchristianize the mass of our citizens? Or have you hopes of converting a few of them to assist you in so bad a cause? We ought to think ourselves happy in the enjoyment of opinion, without the danger of persecution by civil or ecclesiastical law. Our friend, the President of the United States, no, Thomas Jefferson, return to text, has been calumniated for his liberal sentiments by men who have attributed that liberality to a latent design to promote the cause of infidelity. This and all other slanders have been made without a shadow of proof. Neither religion nor liberty can long subsist in the tumult of altercation and amidst the noise and violence of faction. Felix Quixaltus. Adieu. Samuel Adams. Mr. Thomas Paine. My dear and venerable friend Samuel Adams, I received with great pleasure your friendly and affectionate letter of November 30th, and I thank you also for the frankness of it. Between men in pursuit of truth, and whose object is the happiness of man both here and hereafter, there ought to be no reserve. Even error has a claim to indulgence, if not to respect, when it is believed to be the truth. I am obliged to you for your affectionate remembrance of what you style my services in awakening the public mind to a declaration of independence, and supporting it after it was declared. I also, like you, have often looked back on those times, and have thought that if independence had not been declared at the time it was, the public mind could not have been brought up to it afterwards. It will immediately occur to you, who are so intimately acquainted with the situation of things at that time, that I allude to the black times of seventy-six. For though I know, and you, my friend, also know, they were no other than the natural consequence of the military blunders of that campaign, the country might have viewed them as proceeding from a natural inability to support its cause against the enemy, and have sunk under the despondency of that misconceived idea. This was the impression against which it was necessary the country should be strongly animated. I come now to the second part of your letter, on which I shall be as frank with you as you are with me. But, say you, when I heard you had turned your mind to a defense of infidelity, I felt myself much astonished, etc. What, my good friend, do you call believing in God infidelity? For that is the great point maintained in the age of reason against all divided beliefs and allegorical divinities. Note, the ten concluding words of this sentence were omitted from Rickman's edition, the close being in the work alluded to. Editor. Return to text. The Bishop of Landa, Dr. Watson, not only acknowledges this, but pays me some compliments upon it, in his answer to the second part of that work. There is, says he, a philosophical sublimity in some of your ideas when speaking of the creator of the universe. What then, my much esteemed friend, for I do not respect you the less, because we differ, and that, perhaps not much, in religious sentiments, what, I ask, is this thing called infidelity? If we go back to your ancestors and mine three or four hundred years ago, for we must have had fathers and grandfathers, we should not be here, we shall find them praying to saints and virgins, and believing in purgatory and transubstantiation. And therefore all of us are infidels according to our forefathers' belief. If we go back to times more ancient, we shall again be infidels according to the belief of some other forefathers. The case, my friend, is that the world has been overrun with fable and creeds of human invention, with sectaries of whole nations against all other nations, and sectaries of those sectaries in each of them against each other. Every sectary, except the Quakers, has been a persecutor. Those who fled from persecution, persecuted in their turn, and it is this confusion of creeds that has filled the world with persecution and deluged it with blood. Even the depredation on your commerce by the Barbary powers sprang from the crusades of the church against those powers. It was a war of creed against creed, each boasting of God for its author and reviling each other with the name of infidel. If I do not believe as you believe, it proves that you do not believe as I believe, and this is all that it proves. 
There is, however, one point of union wherein all religions meet, and that is in the first article of every man's creed, and of every nation's creed that has any creed at all, I believe in God. Those who rest here, and there are millions who do, cannot be wrong as far as their creed goes. Those who choose to go further may be wrong, for it is impossible that all can be right, since there is so much contradiction among them. The first, therefore, are, in my opinion, on the safest side. I presume you are so far acquainted with ecclesiastical history as to know, and the bishop who has answered me has been obliged to acknowledge the fact, that the books that compose the New Testament were voted by yeas and nays to be the word of God, as you now vote a law by the popish councils of Nice and the Odyssea about 1450 years ago. With respect to the fact, there is no dispute, neither do I mention it for the sake of controversy. This vote may appear authority enough to some, and not authority enough to others. It is proper, however, that everybody should know the fact. Note, this paragraph was omitted by Rickman with a footnote, saying, A paragraph of eleven lines is here omitted, it being a principle with the editor to offend neither the government nor individuals. Its insertion is also unnecessary, as the curious reader will find it answered in a way well worth his notice by the Bishop of Landolf. See his Apology for the Bible, from page 300 to 307. The title Age of Reason is also suppressed in the next paragraph and elsewhere. Editor. Returned text. With respect to the Age of Reason, which you so much condemn, and that, I believe, without having read it, for you say only that you heard of it, I will inform you of a circumstance because you cannot know it by other means. I have said in the first page of the first part of that work that it had long been my intention to publish my thoughts upon religion, but that I had reserved it to a later time of life. I have now to inform you why I wrote it and published it at the time I did. In the first place, I saw my life in continual danger. My friends were falling as fast as the guillotine could cut their heads off, and as I every day expected the same fate, I resolved to begin my work. I appeared to myself to be on my deathbed, for death was on every side of me, and I had no time to lose. This accounts for my writing it at the time I did, and so nicely did the time and the intention meet that I had not finished the first part of that work more than six hours before I was arrested and taken to prison. Joel Barlow was with me and knows the fact. In the second place, the people of France were running headlong into atheism, and I had the work translated and published in their own language to stop them in that career, and fix them to the first article, as I have before said, of every man's creed, who has any creed at all. I believe in God. I endangered my own life in the first place by opposing in the convention the execution of the king, and by laboring to show they were trying the monarchy and not the man, and that the crimes imputed to him were the crimes of the monarchical system. Note on the word monarchical. This word is omitted by Rickman, editor, return to text. And I endangered it a second time by opposing atheism. And yet some of your priests, for I do not believe that all are perverse, cry out in the war-hoop of monarchical priestcraft, What an infidel! What a wicked man is Thomas Paine! They might as well add, For he believes in God, and is against shedding blood. But all this war-hoop of the pulpit, Note, the words of the pulpit omitted by Rickman, Editor, return to text, Has some concealed object. Religion is not the cause, but is the stalking horse. They put it forward to conceal themselves behind it. It is not a secret that there has been a party composed of the leaders of the Federalists, for I do not include all Federalists with their leaders, who have been working in various means for several years past to overturn the Federal Constitution, established on the representative system, and place government in the new world on the corrupt system of the old. Note. The preceding fourteen words omitted by Rickman editor. Return to text. To accomplish this, a large standing army was necessary, and as a pretense for such an army, the danger of a foreign invasion must be bellowed forth from the pulpit, from the press, and by their public orators. 
I am not of a disposition inclined to suspicion. It is, in its nature, a mean and cowardly passion, and upon the whole, even admitting error into the case, it is better. I am sure it is more generous to be wrong on the side of confidence than on the side of suspicion. Note. The words, it is better, and on the side of confidence than, are dropped out of the sentence in Rickman's edition. Editor. Return to text. But I know as a fact that the English government distributes annually fifteen hundred pounds sterling among the Presbyterian ministers in England, and one thousand among those of Ireland. Note. See volume three, page eighty-five of my edition of Payne's Writings, where the amounts are stated as seventeen hundred pounds to the dissenting ministers in England, and eight hundred pounds to those of Ireland. The preceding twenty-nine words and the remainder of this paragraph are omitted by Rickman. Editor, return to text. And when I hear of the strange discourses of some of your ministers and professors of colleges, I cannot, as the Quakers say, find freedom in my mind to acquit them. Their anti-revolutionary doctrines invite suspicion even against one's will, and in spite of one's charity to believe well of them. As you have given me one scripture phrase, I will give you another for those ministers. It is said in Exodus twenty-two, twenty-eight: Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. But those ministers, such I mean as Dr. Emmons, note, Nathaniel Emmons, Doctor of Divinity, 1745 to 1840, 54 years minister of Franklin, Massachusetts, Congregational Church. He was a vehement Federalist, and assailant of President Jefferson. Editor. Return to text. But those ministers, such I mean as Dr. Emmons, curse ruler and people both, for the majority are politically the people, and it is those who have chosen the ruler whom they curse. As to the first part of the verse, that of not reviling the gods, it makes no part in my scripture. I have but one god. Note. This and the preceding sentence are omitted by Rickman. Editor, return to text. Since I began this letter, for I write it by piecemeals, as I have leisure, I have seen the four letters that passed between you and John Adams. In your first letter you say, Let divines and philosophers, statesmen and patriots, unite their endeavors to renovate the age by inculcating in the minds of youth the fear and love of the deity and universal philanthropy. Why, my dear friend, this is exactly my religion, and is the whole of it, that you may have an idea that the age of reason, for I believe you have not read it, inculcates this reverential fear and love of the deity, I will give you a paragraph from it. Quote, Do we want to contemplate his power? We see it in the immensity of the creation. Do we want to contemplate his wisdom? We see it in the unchangeable order by which the incomprehensible whole is governed. Do we want to contemplate his munificence? We see it in the abundance with which he fills the earth. Do we want to contemplate his mercy? We see it in his not withholding that abundance even from the unthankful." Unquote. As I am fully with you in your first part, that respecting the deity, so am I in your second, that of universal philanthropy by which I do not mean merely the sentimental benevolence of wishing well, but the practical benevolence of doing good. We cannot serve the deity in the manner we serve those who cannot do without that service. He needs no service from us. We can add nothing to eternity. But it is in our power to render a service acceptable to him, and that is not by praying, but by endeavoring to make his creatures happy. A man does not serve God when he prays, for it is himself he is trying to serve, and as to hiring or paying men to pray, as if the deity needed instruction, it is in my opinion an abomination. One good schoolmaster is of more use and of more value than a load of such persons as Dr. Emmons and some others. Note. This and the preceding sentence omitted by Rickman. Editor. Return to text. You, my dear and much respected friend, are now far in the vale of years. I have yet, I believe, some years in store, for I have a good state of health and a happy mind, and I take care of both, by nourishing the first with temperance, 
and the latter with abundance. This, I believe, you will allow to be the true philosophy of life. You will see by my third letter to the citizens of the United States that I have been exposed to and preserved through many dangers. But instead of buffeting the deity with prayers as if I distrusted him or must dictate to him, note this and the seventeen preceding words omitted by Rickman, editor, return to text. I reposed myself on his protection, and you, my friend, will find, even in your last moments, more consolation in the silence of resignation than in the murmuring wish of a prayer. In everything which you say in your second letter to John Adams, respecting our rights as men and citizens in this world, I am perfectly with you. On other points, we have to answer to our Creator and not to each other. The key of heaven is not in the keeping of any sect, nor ought the road to it be obstructed by any. Our relation to each other in this world is as men, and the man who is a friend to man and to his rights, let his religious opinions be what they may, is a good citizen to whom I can give, as I ought to do, and as every other ought, the right hand of fellowship. And to none with more hearty good will, my dear friend, than to you. Thomas Paine, Federal City, January 1st, 1803. End of Volume 3 End of the Age of Reason by Thomas Paine